All right, everybody, we are now meeting with Joanne Hurley, and I was involved in curating art, or actually selecting art and commissioning art for the McCormick West Convention Center here in Chicago. And Joanne, and I want to take legal precautions here, Joanne represented one of the artists um, in the collection or that we were selecting and had you know, a number of interesting requests that I thought were totally fine. And I thought my job, my role in that was really interesting because on one hand, you know, I was hired by the convention center, the contractors actually, to select the art and make the presentations. But I always felt like my allegiance was to the artists. And for example, I insisted that when we negotiated the contracts that the McCormick Center wanted to have control of copyright for all the artists' work. And I said, no, that's not up to you. You can own the artwork, but you don't get the copyright, which is how the law in the country tends to work unless the artist gives up copyright. And I think Joanne and I hit it off really nicely because I think we pretty much agreed. And therefore, between the two of us, we got what she wanted for her, the artist that she was working with. So, you know, that's how I know Joanne, and I respect her a lot for the work that she's done with artists. Joanne, you know, as I've asked Michael and others previously, how, where did you go to high school? <laughs> I went to high school in Michigan in uh, Trenton. And did you know you wanted to be a lawyer Detroit. while you were in high school? I'm sorry? Did you know that you wanted to be a lawyer while you were in high school? Um, not immediately. I had thought about um, becoming a spy. There you uh, go. And working for the State Department. But um, I liked the idea of helping people to do what was important to them. And that's what being a lawyer has uh, allowed me to do. At what stage of your studying law did you, and or practicing law did you begin to work with artists and find that a respectable or admirable thing to do? Um, I think fairly early on I had um, people in art um, as clients um, basically because some of them were friends. Um, I think a lot of lawyers start that way. Um, but. Um, I've, I've certainly had a lot of different types of artists that I've worked with um, over the years. Can we name any of these individuals? Can we name the artist that I was talking about at McCormick, or is that a violation of ethics? Uh, no, I think uh, Nick would be fine with that. I represent Nick Cave. And all right, so how did you and Nick get to work together? How did this happen? Um, I started working with Nick um, and with his uh, partner um, in a, uh, you know, Nick is a Renaissance person. Um, he has his finger in a lot of different aspects of the art. And so at the time I think I started working with Nick, uh, initially he was involved in fashion design and so it was working with him at the store and then later uh, issues with regard um, regarding his um, fine art uh, came into play. See, I think it's interesting. I mean, one of the situations I recall at McCormick was that McCormick wanted the right to reproduce any artist artwork whatsoever in any scenario. And Joanne and Nick felt like if the size of the artwork constituted over a certain percentage, maybe half, maybe a third, I don't recall, that then the art, artist had the, the right to sign off on it and take a look at it and approve it or disapprove it. You know, and I think those are the kinds of issues that an artist can, you know, respectfully insist upon sufficiently easily once they reach a certain stature. You know, it may not behoove a young artist in their first time out of the box instituting a lot of um, legal barriers to a sale happening. But let's, let's, let's step aside here, Joanne. And one of the issues that, I mean, most of these artists in this course are between 30 and 70 something. And all of them have a certain history of making art. Most of them are not in gallery situations. What are the legal issues that they should be most conscious of? Well, you know, I think that there's some business issues first um, that we should talk about. Great. What I f find with artists is that despite their incredible talent, 
they don't always think about themselves as being a business person. And I think that's really critical. I think that it is important for them to understand that just because a contract comes to them from whatever source, uh, gallery or whatever else, um, that that contract is not something that cannot be uh, negotiated, that just the more professional it looks, the more it seems to intimidate people, and that's the contract, that's all there is. That is not the case. It is important for the artist, as it was for Nick in our negotiations, um, to have certain um, issues raised. There's a difference between raising an issue and being a difficult artist. Um, raising an issue is um, very important, and it depends on your sophistication, what your sensitivities are as an artist. Um, I like to tell people that the word aggressive is not a four-letter word. It is okay to ask for something. It is okay to push for something. Um, it's just how you do it. There is nasty aggressive and there is nice aggressive. I'll just put it that way. And I think that that's the, the, the preliminary discussion um, that every artist has to hear and then internalize to see how it works for them. It's like walking into a restaurant and saying that you'd like to sit in a particular room. You can say that nasty. You can say that in an assertively nice way. I always get what I want in that context, but it's because I've got a big smile on my face and I know exactly what I want. And so that's, I think, the first thing I'd like everybody to think about. Um, beyond that, there's the whole world of copyright law. And I think that a lot of artists are not as educated about copyright law as they should be. The law was, um, was designed to protect what is so special in our culture, which is our art. And basically, what you have to understand with copyright law is that as soon as you affix something to a medium, whether it is um, in uh, oils, in uh, watercolor, whatever it is, in sculpture, whatever it is, that that is when your rights arise. And you have to be confident and knowledgeable about that to be able to comfortably assert those rights when you're dealing with a gallery or a buyer or anyone else. Um, and those rights, um, for your purposes, and there's about six different categories of rights, but for your purposes, it's the right to reproduce um, the work, the right to prepare derivatives. Uh, think about Monet and um, his um, haystack um, uh, paintings, for instance, the right to distribute and the right to publicly display. Those are your rights. And as soon as you put that idea into a fixed medium, you're protected. Now, um, it's important for me to tell you that if you have an idea for a piece, that idea is not protectable. And because it's not protectable, you're not going to tell anyone exactly what that idea is. If, if you are being commissioned, you can say something in a generic way, but then should another artist decide to do something very similar, that simply isn't protected. Your, your copyright protection starts once you have something fixed in a medium. Um, and when I first started practicing law, we had to uh, reflect um, a copyright um, designation or notice onto any type of, um, of work that you were going to seek copyright for, that's not the case anymore. But it is important if you've got a major work um, to think about copywriting. And copywriting is a very simplistic mechanism these days. It is a mechanism that um, can be done online. It's something that 
when I have a artist that ha is very prolific, I usually prepare the first copyright application for them, teach them about it, and then let them go ahead and do the rest themselves. Hold on, let's back up a sec. Yep. You know, it used to be that you had to post copyright on a work of art and put a C with a circle on it to suggest that you were um, copywriting something. Right. And then I, I, copyright essentially became a right that all works of art have. That's right. And so if that's the case, then why do you need to copyright something? Because what you want to do is you want to give a notice to people that this is your work and then if they should infringe that work, you have extra rights, you have um, uh, statutory damages that you can seek, um, and that's important. Also, if somebody should infringe your work, you could not sue them for copyright infringement without having filed copyright application. So it gives you, by filing copyright application, which you suggest for doing something significant, it gives you more rights than the automatic copyright that you have by definition. It does, and you could, somebody who was prolific could copyright once a year, once every few years. Um, if, if somebody has reached a certain level um, in their uh, art career, then I talk in terms of doing it periodically um, because that's what gives the greatest protection, but it's all a, a cost analysis at that point. Okay. Should I, ask, should I shift gears here and ask a different question? Um, or do you want to go out and stick with copyright more? Let's see. We could we could stick with copyright. Um, I think that the important thing to remember is that you are the one who has the rights in your work. And just as Paul was saying that uh, Nick and I were not in favor um, of, um, of the arts organization um, that he was working with taking copyright, you should not give up copyright easily. Um, an important thing to remember is someone can buy your piece of, of art. They can have it on their wall, love it, but that does not give them copyright ownership. You're still retaining your right to reproduce that work, to prepare the derivatives, to display the work. And so the, the physical um, aspect of the art is not something that once I buy a piece of work, I don't own copyright. That remains in the person who had the talent to create that work originally. And those are really the basics of copyright. If you get that, if you get the basics of the right to reproduce, the uh, right to have derivative works, the right to distribute copies, for instance, you are the kind of artist that somebody might want to license your work to go on, greeting cards, whatever else. Um, uh, also the right to display it. Those are your rights. And, and it really does come down to, it, to um, copyright can be synthesized into just those rights. You know, for example, this, you know, what we're really talking about here is if you sell the copyright with the work of art, you know, the person who acquires your painting and gets the copyright, can make posters out of which, you know, they can manipulate it however they want and you have no rights. And or they can sell it for napkins or, po you know, um, postage stamps and you get none of the income. If you keep the copyright, you know, you have the right to use the image and that person cannot malign it or use it to their advantage without your permission. That's absolutely correct. I think there's a couple of people, Joanne, that have specific questions about copyright. I'm not sure if these are folks who have their hands left up from before, except I know Meredith didn't ask a question before. I don't think so. So let's, Meredith, let's take some questions about, this should be about copyright. We're going to cover contracts in a moment. Meredith, yes. go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, recently in talking to uh, uh, somebody at Lawyers for the Creative Arts, um, she mentioned a uh, date of publication in reference to to my um, 
my artwork. Uh, and and it was very confusing to me. And uh, we weren't really um, there for that subject, so I didn't go into it. But I got the impression that if I showed my work uh, in a show, that was tantamount to publishing it. And I had to group all the uh, paintings in that uh, show together. Uh, it was very confusing to me. So I've never done it. Yeah, um, you know, publication is a it is a confusing concept, um, and how it comes about is it it's dealt with on the duration of copyright. So we know that um, copyright is basically um, for works created after January first, seventy eight is the life of the author plus 70 years, if there's a single author. What happens, though, is that um, for, and that's whether works are published or unpublished. Um, if a work is, um, is published, there's different um, time frames that can come into play. The problem is it's not real clear in the law what publication is. And every yeah, no, it's 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 not. And every time I have a new um situation that comes up, I have to go back, see if there's any new case law, and inevitably there isn't. And so I there has been some discussions about displaying your work um, being tantamount to publishing, um, I'm not 100% sure that that would um, prove to be the case. Um, I do know that if if you've um, if you've uh, licensed the work um, to a company who's going to do greeting cards, put it on T-shirts, whatever, that that gives um, publication. But beyond that, it is a it is a confusing concept. I think that um, it comes really more into play with works made for hire, hmm. and basically, most of you are not going to be in that situation. The work that you're doing is work that you're going to be judged on your life plus seventy years. So I think that you could simplify things in your mind and think about it that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, somebody asked a question by text to me, Joanne. Mm -hmm. when, what about when an artist sells a work to a museum? Does the copyright more often transfer to the museum or the copyright remains with the artist? And if a museum wants to make a reproduction, a poster, um, they get the artist's permission and, split, and give them some proceeds. I think that um, it generally stays with the um, artist, is my experience. There, uh, there could be situations where they negotiate it otherwise, but I don't think so. I think that I certainly, for anybody I represented, would be fighting for them to keep copyright. And I don't, I think that museums respect their artists, and I don't think they would be asking for that. I think I, I agree with you. Jason, your question. Jason? Jason, if you got a question, I'm going to try you again in a moment. Um, Joyce, your turn. When I was doing public Louder, art. Louder, if you can, Joyce. Okay. When I was doing public art commissions, I believe that the copyright generally uh, went to the commission there, and um, I was doing state. Uh, public art commissions, and um, I, am, I presume that's under work for hire. Um, is that typical when work is commissioned that the copyright goes with the work? It could be. It could be um, depending on what um, the um, concept of the commission was. Um, if it's if it's somebody wanting to commission a piece from an artist. Um, because they respect their work, that's one thing. If it's um, somebody wanting to use a a picture 
on uh, something, uh, on a website, on something like that, I think that's totally different. That's more of a work for hire concept. The one thing that you have to know is that um, work for hire is often misused. Um, and even when lawyers draft work for hire contracts, we're not always sure what's going to be included um, under the work for hire concept. And so we hedge with a, a clause that says, if for any reason the work for hire um, uh, concept is rejected, that there'll be an assignment of copyright. And so, um, yes, I think that the commission concept that you're thinking of was more of a work for hire, but you should have, if, if something is an important enough commission, I think that you should have an attorney take a look at it and see whether um, loss of copyright is really appropriate. Okay, thank you. All right, Mike, your turn. Yeah. Uh, I'm a sculptor, and say we make a sculpture and it's set up. Can you get a little louder and closer, Mike? Yeah. Uh, Thanks. If we make a sculpture and it's set out in a public way, uh, I suspect that making a three-dimensional copy of that is covered. What about photography? Is that just wide open to uh, use? or? No, no, no. Photography is the same thing. It's It's something that... It has been created, it's fixed in a medium, which is the paper or for for a, a computerized. Um, I think Mike's talking about what if he makes a sculpture and what about people photographing it? Oh, photographing it. Um, yes. Okay, um, in that situation, um, there's been some litigation with a sculpture park um, where people had taken pictures and then tried to use those commercially, and that practice was struck down um, by um, a court. So no, taking that's that derivative right that you have as the copyright owner is to reproduce it, and reproducing is done by photography. And so um, if somebody is doing that with your works, um, then that isn't permitted. Um, there is a distinction between uh, at times on whether it's on private property or public property, but it is something to explore if that's happening with any of your work. You know, the interesting thing about that at uh, Millennium Park in Chicago, where there's a number of huge works of art, is that the guards tend to not allow you to take a photograph if you have a tripod. And if you don't have a tripod, they assume that the, the quality of the image isn't going to be so fabulous that you can create a reproduction. And then they figure it's for personal use, and then they tend to allow that. Right. Mm -hmm. I find that sort of interesting. All right, yeah. Sharon, go ahead. Is that me? Sharon? Gilmore. Hi, Hi Joanne. Uh, I think I might be in big trouble. Um, occasionally, I do collages in which I use images from National Geographic or old uh, prints of Ansel Adams or um, war pictures. I cut them up and uh, put them together. Um, probably a bit yes, that is problematic. Yeah. Go ahead, explain some more, Joanne. Well, what you're doing is you're taking, um, you're taking the work of other people and you're not getting their permission to take and create a new work from their work. So actually what you're doing is you're creating a derivative conceptually from all of the component artists involved and unless the work is in public domain because it's very old, um, you are um, possibly going to have problems with that work. So the, the, if that is your style, the more you establish your, your reputation and grow your art career, the more problematic it will be. What should she do? 
<laughs> well, I think um isn't there isn't there a notion that the, the extent to which he modifies borrowed images is relevant or am I mistaken here? Well, you know, that's you know, we used to talk about that in terms of uh how many bars of a song can somebody take and right. the answer is if it's identifiable. So, um if what you have of an artist is identifiable, then I think you have a problem and you would have to seek permission and basically a license from them and that's going to be expensive for you. So unfortunately you've picked a, a, a art uh, concept that is problematic from a copyright standpoint. What if you're taking photographs of storefronts, big ones, big famous ones, and embellishing those and making um, sexy altered images? Not prurient, just, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when somebody films, there are location releases that are obtained. Uh, and a location release says that the person has the right to film um, at that location. And so similarly, um, I think that you could have, you could, I could make the argument that there should be a release or permission granted for um, taking those um, pictures unless you're going to so distort with the sexy aspect of it um, that um, somebody's not going to know where it originated. A couple of people have posted comments about Shepard Ferry and taking images, you know, known images and, I don't know, altering or embellishing them. What about him? You know, um, I think that problem in the art and the entertainment world on copyright issues is is somebody does something and they don't necessarily people don't know what what they've done in the way of getting releases um and then they emulate it um and someone else doesn't get into trouble and they first time off have a problem so I think that um, I think that you have to be cautious, and that has to copyright is best analyzed on a very fact specific situation. And I think that if somebody was going to use images from another artist, um, that they should um, have that very carefully analyzed by an attorney. Um, to make sure that they're not at risk. Sounds like a lot of pain in the butt and rigmarole, and it's easier to alter the art that you make that doesn't take images that theoretically endanger you than it is to go ahead and try and find permission from all these folks who may not even bother to respond. It, it very, very much so. All right, I think we should, I, I think there's more questions about copyright, but I want to talk about contracts too. Mm -hmm. And then if we have time, we can come back and open it up to questions about, con you know, so contracts and copyright. But let's go to contracts for a moment. So in my experience is that almost all the high caliber galleries, and therefore by extension the lower ones too, I think, typically do not have contracts with their artists. And very few art, there are very few dealer art gallery um, slash artist contract relationships. Conversely, I think most, almost all galleries have consignment agreements with their artists that acknowledge that they're responsible for the artwork. Um, would you like, can you comment about the difference between contracts and consignment agreements and what you perceive the norm to be? Well, you know, a contract or a consignment agreement, whether you use the word contract or agreement, it's the same thing. Now, um, if the distinction is that um, one gallery is buying someone's um, uh, piece as opposed to having a consignment situation, 
that is a different kind of contract. So basically, um, you know, it, it's, it's still a contract. It's still a contract. Endemic in the art world as well as the entertainment world is everything is low key until you get to a certain money level, somebody becomes successful, the dollars become very big, and then um, people realize when there's lawsuits in the industry that they could have been totally avoidable. But in the beginning, they don't want to spend the money or the time to do things right. Um, that's really the hardest battle um, for a lawyer is making sure that things are done the right way. And, you know, in different states, there are consignment um, uh, statutes. Illinois has um, the um, uh, Consignment of Art Act, which gives certain protections, but the artist is not as protected as they should be without a contract. It's that basic. Um, because, you know, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I also represent um, some art advisors. And um, one of my art advisors had a uh, piece um, delivered and the, uh, for a client, and the work was um, very much damaged. And the gallery said, well, we, um, we ensure we had it sent by FedEx and FedEx only insured for something, I don't know, like a hundred dollars max. And it was a, a multiple thousand dollar purchase. And so, um, we got into this very difficult discussion between the artist, the purchaser, and the gallery, and the gallery just would not take responsibility for the damage, and in the end, the insurance company that the purchaser um, uh, had brought in to insure the piece was able to do a restoration, but it was a very long, drawn-out process and took away, and the artist was extremely frustrated with the situation, and I'm sure what has rethought their allegiance to the particular gallery. So the point is, is that damage to a uh, work is something that is definitely dealt with in the agreement. Uh, another situation was that um, an agreement was, uh, was signed, but then the list of the pieces that the artist had sent, so what the consigned art items were, was not adequately covered. And um, when the artist asked for the piece back, the gallery said they never received it. So that's another area of concern. So from my standpoint, um, anyone who, who is going to dedicate their life to art um, and expects to make a living from it needs to treat seriously the concept of a contract and they need to protect themselves and it's basically on all the big money issues. Um, who's responsible for shipping? Who's responsible for damage? Who's responsible for loss uh, or stolen goods? Um, does the gallery have to insure the work? All of those kinds of issues um, are important, um, and um, whether the artist can get an accounting to make sure that um, that they uh, have information about what the artwork was sold for, uh, what happens if the price of um, the the agreed price of the artwork is reduced, who is paying, who is, who is taking the brunt of that reduction. All of those kinds of what I call nuts and bolts issues, as opposed to strictly legal issues, are things that are needed to protect the artist. All of you spend an enormous amount of time and passion creating artwork, and you have to respect 
respect yourselves by treating what you do as a business as well as the creative um, talent that you have. And so that's how I look at um, the necessity for a contract. Okay, let's see if we got questions. But you guys, I still see the same hands up. I want to hear questions about contracts. And in 10 minutes or so, we can open up to questions on any subject. So I see, all right, thank you, Sharon Gilmore, for taking your hand. Oh, here we got hands up there. All right, wait a minute. Are these hands going up or down? Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Joanne, thanks for meeting with us. Uh, yes. I got the impression, though, that if in the gallery world, um, usually a contract is uh, not drawn up and it's uh, usually, you know, like a shake of hands between friends, then why the stress, or did I misunderstand somewhere along the line, why the stress on having a contract and protecting yourself every which way from Sunday? Okay. So um, you and I shake hands and we think we are agreed on who's going to pay uh, for shipping. But we really haven't communicated well enough. And so what a contract does, it doesn't need to be a negative anti-relationship document. It, is, it can be a document that just makes sure that you and the gallery are on the same page. I say to people that it's important in order to be able to maintain a long-term relationship with a gallery that you put certain things in writing. One is, what's the list of all the work that you're consigning? Two, what are the prices that are going to be um, used for those um, pieces of art? When are you going to be paid? Um, uh, what's going to happen if there is a price reduction? Is it taken off of your um, share of the um, price or is it taken off the gallery? Who's responsible for damage? All of those things, um, and I can, I, I've practiced law for over 30 some years and I just know that people don't always communicate as well as they should and that's why having a contract really is just like two friends talking together and making sure that they're on the same page. But we're really not friends. We're, we have relationships with the people we do business with. We can have friendly relationships with them, but in order to maintain them, we need to make sure that we, are, we have the same expectations. That's why I think it's important. Okay, but the gallery doesn't do business. Let's say Gallery X simply does not uh, do uh, business through contracts and has never done such and uh, has got a fine track record. Would you still insist on going the contract route? I would, but what I might do is I might do it in a little softer way and have it be a letter agreement instead of a more formal looking contract. And basically, mm -hmm. it can be, it can be, um, a synopsis of what your discussions have been to make it seem a little less intimidating to the gallery. So what are we going to do about price? Well, the price is going to be the price set out on the consignment list. And um, if there's a reduction, what happens? What's the agreement? Um, who's responsible for shipping? Usually the artist is responsible for shipping to the gallery and the gallery when they're returning the artwork is responsible. Um, what about, and this is one that's been a problem for some of my art advisors, what if the piece of uh, art is sent out to the potential buyer on an approval basis? Who's bearing the responsibility for shipping or damage at that point? So it's, it's things that need to be discussed one way or the other, and they can be done a little bit softer, but it's going to make sure that, that what you care about, i.e. your art, is protected. Okay. You can Thank send you. us it through personality and the softest of the way it looks, where 
the terms are all the same kind of terms you would cover in a more formal looking contract. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, you know, if, some, if you're talking to a dealer who's not willing to make these concessions, I'm not even sure concessions is the right word. Um, you know, not you can, willing to act like a business, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can you may you can make a, a decision about whether or not you want to participate with those people. You may want to work with them anyway and figure the risk is worth it. And maybe you know the thing won't get damaged, and maybe you won't have a problem. I might be prone to doing that. I feel like lawyers are more cautious and cautionary than artists are. And I know, and I, I think you're right, but it's because we're the ones who sit in our offices and hear all the problems and the frustration of people who've had work damaged, um, who have lost months and months of work, um, and and that's why we feel that way. I think that I have had clients create contracts out of email, <laughs> and I think that it could be done by email as long as there's clarity on what the different issues are. Not the best situation, but it would be it would be one I have certainly pieced together about thirty emails once and gotten about sixty thousand for somebody on on an issue so it does it does work as a worst case if you need to, but I think that everyone needs to respect their work enough and their talent enough to treat things right when it's important to them. All right, let's reiterate, Joanne. What are the issues that one basic contract issues? Um, discount. Well, how do we share discounts? What um, happens? Yep, one is how you share discounts. Um, um, what happens if the work gets damaged and where and by who? Yes. You know, most uh, galleries are acceptable. Most, I think, you know, I mean, you can also extrapolate from state contract law. I'm familiar with Illinois. I'm not familiar with other states. Yep. But, you know, it says basically is, you know, I mean, and then you have certain kinds of door-to-door -door coverage, which means from the time the art leaves my, my the artist's door until it gets back to my door, Yep. You know, the gallery is responsible for its well-being. Um, so that covers the damage issue. I mean, these are very basic, pretty mundane kinds of um, considerations that a reputable gallery shouldn't have a problem with. Then no, it would be reluctant to sign a contract if it looks like a contract. But if there's an email exchange and or a signed agreement that spells it out, they should be fine with it. What other issues should we have on there, Joanne? Um, we should have um, when the artist is paid. So, for instance, is it going to be um, 10 days after the end of the month in which a sale has um, been made? Um, is it uh, 30 days after the sale has been made? What happens if there are um, payments? So say um, a buyer pays in three payments, uh, when is the artist getting their money? Um, that's an important issue. Um, another issue that has come up with galleries and it's, you know, in this um, financial setting, it's an important issue is um, whether the, um, whether title to the work is going to the gallery or not when it's in a consignment situation. Now, logically, it is not. Under Illinois law and our statute is clearly not. But the issue is, what happens if the gallery files for bankruptcy? Is that artwork sitting there in a consignment situation belong to the gallery and the gallery's creditors or not? And so that's an an issue that's important. It's an issue that we have in law generally, um, and we've used the method of putting a sticker on the back of an item. Um, uh, there's technical issues with filing uh, liens, making it clear that there's um, that the gallery doesn't own the the uh, work, but something needs to be handled on that issue, on that worst case that the 
a gallery is not as financially stable as you would like. Um, it, whether the um, artist can terminate the contract or uh, slash business relationship or uh, eliminate a particular consigned item on 30 days notice or something like that. Um, that can be an important issue. Um, whether the gallery is your exclusive gallery or not, and if not, what the scope of the um, geographic representation is. Yeah, the territorial expectation. Yep, exactly. Um, whether the gallery is going to carry insurance on the artwork um, so that if there's a fire, uh, whether there's going to be the financial wherewithal to pay the uh, artist the value of the price as set forth on that consignment list. Um, when we go full scale on an agreement, we talk about that there's no reproduction rights except for catalog or promotional materials. Um, there's um, and then the accounting aspect. And the accounting gives the artist the right. And it's not a right that is used very often, but it's important to have the right to be able to look in the books and the records of the gallery as to your sales only in order to make sure that you've been fully paid. And sometimes <clears throat> it's not an issue of the gallery trying to cheat the artist. It's just that the gallery could have bookkeeping issues, and when you've done an accounting, um, then you can determine that, in fact, there was one painting that was sold um, that you should have gotten paid for. So, you know, uh, there's a lot of different issues that it's prudent to handle uh, up front to maintain that relationship with the gallery. Um, oh, I got it. I forgot my question, but it came back to me. That's amazing. Um, is it appropriate for an artist to be entitled to know to whom their art was sold? <laughs> um, generally, um, the yeah, I'm pulling the camera. The ca yeah, I'm only oh, seeing. Yeah. The top. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. There you go. Yep. Um, generally, unless you have that right in a contract you're not going to be able to get that right um, um, from um, any of the consignment laws or anything. But you can understand why from the gallery's perspective, that's a client of theirs. They don't want the artist to go directly to that client. Um, and so that's a hard right to be able to get. And it's a hard issue to be able to negotiate in a contract. What are the issues that are relevant to our, let's say you post your image to your website. Do you have any protection in terms of it being, isn't that publishing it? And then what happens if you put your art on your website? What are the legal considerations? Well, um, I would make sure that that website has um, copyright notice that says that um, all rights um, are, uh, all rights are uh, maintained. Um, someone cannot download that picture without a violation of your copyright rights. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, people deal with that issue and photographers deal with that issue by um, taking and putting, embedding uh, a, a symbol of some kind in the middle of an image so that someone doesn't download a photograph. And similarly, our, um, artists could do the same type of thing if it was the type of work that could be downloaded and then um, licensed um, in, in, as an infringement of the artist's um, rights. So, I, you know, I, I think it's important that the artist does put work on their website, but those kinds of protections could be important to them. Cool. Um, maybe at this point, 
what do we got? We've got another 10 or 15 minutes left. Maybe we should take questions in any kind of legal issue people want to ask. Look at all those noises of people raising their hands. Um, I don't know which way to go. I'm going to start at the top of the alphabet. Alana, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I worked as a photographer for four years taking pictures of celebrities, and I'm painting over those photographs and changing them quite drastically, but the celebrities are recognizable. Um, but I took the photographs myself. I'm not using other people's photographs, but I don't have um, releases from the um, celebrities, the movie stars, to use their image, but every photograph was taken in like a press conference or um, where there were, you know, lots of other photographers in, in that kind of situation. I'm sorry, um, Alana, so you're saying that that most of them were taken in uh, at press conferences? Yes, or similar type of venues. Hmm. I think in that context, you know, um, celebrities have rights on as to who can um, commercialize um, their voice, their image, that type of thing. Um, the fact that they were in a press release situation, um, or a, you know, a press conference kind of situation, I think could make a difference. Um, the fact you took the image obviously is critical because now what you're doing with your photography is doing a derivative work in a new medium. Um, you could have problems with some of them. There are some that really seek to protect their image, um, but it, it may be that you're okay. It's It's a hard... I'd have to go through and take a look at jurisdictions um, um, as far as where the artist, um, the celebrity resides, because that could make the difference. But um, it could be okay, but it's something that you should have probably have somebody look at more closely. Thank you. Somebody asked a question about droit de suite, and I have a, you know, what do you think about residual artist royalties and artist rights, and do you think it'll ever become the law of the land? No, um, I don't. Um, I think that we have certain rights that we think about in the States about making sure that someone doesn't um, pretend that um, that one person created a art piece uh, when somebody else really did. That I, we do respect here, but um, I, I don't, it, it could have become part of the law of the land years and years ago, and it hasn't, so I don't think it will. Interesting. Okay. Um, let me see who's got questions here. I think Joyce does. Joyce, do you have another question? I do. Um, I, cool. have a show, I have a show coming up, and um, I've inquired about contracts. If you could be a little louder and closer, Joyce, that would be helpful, okay. please. Thank right. you. I have a show coming up, and I've inquired about contracts. They've been very vague, and um, it's kind of like asking for a prenup, I think. You know, it's sort of like oh, you know, you're going to be a problem. Maybe we don't really want to deal with you. Um, so, you know, I don't want to kill the relationship, but I want to be protected. That's one question. And the second one is if I uh, spell out questions I have in an email and they get answered or some of them are ignored, um, does that constitute a contract, even though there's no actual signature on an email response? Um, 
Let's start with your first one. So um, the show is at a gallery? Yes. Um, I think I think that what you want to say to them is I'm I'm very excited about the show, but there are some basics that I need to confirm, and um, those basics are as follows. And, and you know, just always show enthusiasm, but then um, be what I sort of call quietly firm that there's some things you need to work out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so is that how you manipulated me so well? <laughs> I'm sorry. Is that how you manipulated me so well? Yes. <laughs> I, didn't um, know we, I didn't know we had a disagreement. <laughs> no, we didn't. Um, because you definitely were so sensitive to the artist issues that we worked. At, we just talked about. Our, what our needs were. And see, Joyce, I think that's the thing to remember. If you say to somebody, here is my concern, it, it's hard if they respect you to ignore that. Um, and so I think that's something to remember. Um, Joyce, you had a second part of your question. Right, and it was, uh, if I ask these questions in an email mm. and with their response, but there is no actual signature, does it constitute a contract? It, it can, it can, because what you've got is um, the, the name, I mean, this, I haven't seen any case law on this, but we dealt with this issue years ago with faxes and with um, um, uh, memos. And so I think by analogy, the fact that there's a to and a from and somebody responds, the problem with email uh, derived contract is the language often is very loose. Um, can we do this? Uh, sure, go ahead, you know, that kind of thing. So when I write an email, I write in the same way that I write anything else. It's very tightly constructed. Okay. So if you have to go that route, just just think about that. Okay. Think All about right. the fact you don't want to be 14 and writing a text. You want to be the adult professional that you are. Thank you. Monica, your turn. Be loud. Uh, big question. I was uh, channel hopping on television some time ago, year 2003, and I decided to put everything on a DVD. I recorded approximately two and a half hours while I was cruising from one channel to the other. And after that, I edited it down to three videos to be seen consecutively with the sound, um, approximately half an hour each. Now, there's an element where the time of the excerpt was brief. Uh, I would only use it in academic or teaching situations. I would not offer it for sale. Uh, any input on that? Um. Okay, your voice was very soft, but it sounded to me like what you were saying is that you took um, footage and you uh, recorded it um, from um, certain um, programs and then reduced it down um, to um, a certain length and are going to use it in an educational context? Correct. Okay, so um, fair use allows you to um, use materials for educational um, purposes, including commenting about something. Um, here's a piece of film that, that demonstrates this concept, and then you would talk about it. That is something that generally is permissible, although as I, I tried to tell um, everybody today, each of these examples has to be taken um, and 
looked at very closely in order to make sure that um, that everything's permissible. But I can see arguments for the permissibility of that approach. And All right. And that educational concept. All right, I'm not sure who's got more questions here or not. I mean, I can see hands, but they might be old ones. No, um, mine is new. Who's that? Go ahead. Meredith. Hey, you know what? Maybe the others of you have questions can sequentially unmute yourself instead of me trying to figure it out. Meredith, proceed. Thank you. Um, uh, I know several young artists who are very excited about the website Pinterest, where you uh, pin uh, images, uh, and they would be pinning images of their work, and they think it would be a huge marketing tool. My concern is that um, a website, putting your images on a website, the purpose of which is to disseminate them, the whole idea is that people pick them up and, and uh, repin them, and your images get disseminated that way and spread. Uh, I'm concerned that that would constitute some kind of dilution of my copyright rights because I'm posting something on a website where the assumption is that people will reuse it. Does that make any sense? If they're going to reuse it um, and create a collage or, or reuse it, no, and, okay. No, they just they just disseminate it. Okay. Just so say, oh, this is cool. Look at this. Oh, okay. They post it. They repost it. I think that what I would want to see on that kind of website is one, my copyright notice, um, and two, a statement that says that the website um, is for the dissemination of art and the education of the general public on the um, great art that's out there, but the none of the works that are um, pinned up there um, can be used in a derivative format and that the um, artists all retain their own copyright. If it had something like that on it, which I think would be a really good thing even if they haven't thought about it themselves to add, then I think it would be okay. Well, I, the corollary, uh, I'm sorry, the corollary is, is what I do with my art letter, and that is I hope people steal it, you know, and right. reproduce it any way they want, and that I get some attention as a result of it, and right. that I don't really care. You know, and I, I'm asking you, Meredith, what's the downside of people, you know, reproducing your art? What if they even made a no, I, of it? I, I would I would like that to happen. What I'm concerned about is, do I would I be in danger of having uh, at some future date be deemed to have ceded some of my copyright rights because um, I've allowed this to happen? Interesting. And question. the website is like a big scrapbook. Incidentally, there's there's no opportunity to say this is copyrighted. You know. Um, I think that um, it's an in it is an interesting concept. I think what I would say is that um, you have a right. I think about copyright and I explain it to my clients. I draw a circle and I say, okay, this is all of your rights. And you have a right to, um, to uh, create a little pie from that circle and to give that out to people for different purposes, and that's called licensing. This would be basically a free uh, license to have your image on their site. You have a right to do that. That doesn't take away from your copyright. So I think that mm -hmm. I would uh, go with Paul that this would be a good way to get your name out there and your type of works known and it would not negatively affect your copyright. Cool. Thank you. Okay. I'm getting tired. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to ask a question real quick. This is Jason. Go ahead, Jason. Please do. Yeah. I, uh, so uh, I'm a sculptor uh, living and working in Chicago. Um, I have a live-work situation. And uh, my issue, I guess, or the question is, uh, is twofold. 
Um, we've had a series of city inspectors coming in to my studio and home um, who have said, you know, the first thing is, where is your business license? So the first question yeah. is, as an artist who does not, you know, I do not privately make sales. You know, I make sales through galleries. Do I need a business license? And then the second part of that is uh, these inspectors, you know, have insisted on the business license. So it's, I thought, okay, well, I'll get one. Um, and now the city is saying that I need a parking space for all of my customers. Huh. Um, is there, you know, so the second part of the, uh, of the question is, is there an organization or a person or somebody that I could talk to in the city who could look at my case and say, oh, he's clearly an artist who does not have customers and therefore does not have to furnish the parking space um, and still get a license. So yeah. yeah, basically, Jason, what's happening is the city of Chicago um, is, um, is enforcing its business license issues much more stringently than it has in the past as a revenue source. Um, and so um, I would say, you are a business in their concept. I wouldn't have thought about it either for you, but if they've um, if they've gotten into into where you are because it's a um, live work situation, I think it's going to be very hard to fight. I think that you could fight the issue of the parking from the standpoint that you are not making sales from your live work space and therefore you don't need parking. Parking is part of the zoning regs. And if you wanted to call, um, well, obviously Chicago are uh, the um, uh, lawyers for the creative arts could take a look. I could take a quick look at what they're saying and, um, and address that issue. Um, it may be just talking to, you have to think about the fact that these city inspectors don't deal with artists day in and day out, and they need to be educated, and that's what your problem is. That, that, that is absolutely the problem. You know, yeah. I had a guy come in and look at, look at a piece of art, you know, at a sculpture of mine, and say, like, what is this, an art? You know, I mean, that's... <laughs> You know, it's like, I, you know, and it's, you know, I mean, I'm not loaded. So, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, do you hire a lawyer to to work this out? Or is there somebody that I can go to and just say, listen, this is the fact, you know, is there something that can be done, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, that is the purpose for Lawyers for the Creative Arts to provide free services, um, through volunteer lawyers or if you don't qualify income wise to um, be able to have lower rates. Um, so, you know, that's certainly one alternative. Um, I don't know that it would um, be an extremely time consuming situation. So, um, you know, we might be able to help you um, our way as well. So, you know, if you want to give us a call, um, uh, we could talk about that as well, um, but, you know, your choice. Are you giving out your contact information, Joanne? Um, uh, you know, it's, Paul, it's on that copyright. Um, you want me to send that to everybody? I will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm ready to call it a night, but if somebody else has got an interesting question, I'm, I'm, I'm game to hear it. Anybody want to unmute yourself and ask a question? One quick question. Loud, Sharon, be loud. Okay, um, one quick question. If in creating my artwork, I use a technical diagram that I've uh, downloaded from the internet, some scientific diagrams, does that infringe on their copyright? Um, it could. Um, a scientific diagram could be a comp compilation of data 
or it could be creative. And it would depend in my mind, uh, first thought on it, um, on whether it was just um, technical information which has been deemed not to be original and therefore not subject to copyright. Um, or it could be something that, yes, you're infringing. Okay. Anybody else? I just have one quick question, Joanne. I love how you guys are saying they're quick. Go for it, Sharon. <laughs> Um, does a copyright uh, also apply internationally? Ooh, that's a good one. If you have a copyright of your work in the United States, is it the same in Berlin or in South Africa or wherever? Yeah. Um, there are certain treaties um, that exist and that countries that are part of those treaties respect the copyright um, uh, laws of the other country. And so um, it will depend on which country is involved and whether they are a member of the particular treaties. And the name of the treaty is? You would ask me that at 9.30 at night. <laughs> um, actually, if you will email me I will uh, get it for you. Okay. That and I'll send you. I'll send you Joanne's email contact information for Paul. Paul. Uh, yes, sir. I just have uh, one thing on Jason's uh, dilemma, his problem with the city. I think he should uh, talk to his alderman or his precinct captain. Get uh, get the inspectors to back off of this. You know, it, it's not a bad idea, but. My experience with aldermen has not been that their offices are, oh, what nice word do I want to say? They're, they're just not as sophisticated as we would like them to be. And so while that could be tried, it may not be as effective as you would think it might be. As it turns out, uh, not the not the alderman that I'm uh, currently in the zone of, but uh, I did have an issue with an alderman trying to rezone a property that I was looking to purchase, um, and I was flat out literally asked to bribe the the said alderman. Yeah. Is this the same alderman you have now? No. Uh, no, no, it's not. No, this may be a good guy. You never know. Understand how they can force you to have parking when all the businesses on Broadway just have street parking. They well, like yeah, it, it's based on zoning, and the the zoning in the city, um, you know, is by um, different areas, and so basically, um, it'll be as they're in granting a business license, they are doing a zoning analysis. And so that's how they've come up with this parking issue. We've dealt with other zoning issues on business licenses for our um, business clients. And that's why I think that it's a issue that needs to be, um, it's an education issue. Cool. I think it's time to stop. Joanne, I think you've shared a wealth of information, and I really appreciate it. I also appreciate how complicated so much of these issues are, and that, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, it can't be simpler for artists to comprehend what their rights are or how they are compromised, depending on what they're doing with different kinds of behavior. I think it's nice, if, you know, the Lawyers for the Creative Arts in Chicago is a pretty good, healthy, conscientious entity that unfortunately is overworked. Um, and, you know, frequently it's hard for them to get back to you punctually. And I think to a large extent, it's Bill Ratner who's doing a lot of the work, um, who's a good guy. But, you know, Absolutely, Bill is. He, he was retired and then came back for the last 10 years, has been unretired and, you know, doing this pro bono work. And he's pretty, you know, remarkable for that. And so are you, Joanne, for sharing this stuff tonight and giving all this information, and I appreciate it. Joanne has shared with me earlier today a document about copyright, and I will send that to all of you, and that has her contact information on there. 
So, Joanne, thank you very, very much. I'm unmuting everyone so that they can share my sentiments. Um, everybody is now unmuted. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you. I want to stop the recording now, and I want to say one more thing. Um, hold on. Hold on.